Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome again um, to my fellow MIT tens. My name is Christina Hill. Thank you so much for joining us as we kick off 2021 with our fourth installment of the MIT 10 Brass Rat Chats. This is a career program created exclusively for us. So I mentioned graduates within the last 10 years from MIT, um, created by the MIT Alumni Association. This series is designed to be a place where MIT 10 alums can come together as young professionals to explore uh, professional areas of interest and, and gather together as a group of peers. We've all had different journeys in our professional paths. <clears throat> some of us might still be happy with our employer. Um, some of us might be in grad school or going back to grad school soon. And some of you might be like me, uh, kind of wondering what's next, curious about what's out there and uh, still trying to figure out what you might wanna do when you grow up. <laughs> so regardless of where you are on your path, this series is for all of us young alums to gather around the virtual fireside and to hear some stories and insights shared from our fellow MIT alumni. So tonight, our career area of interest is social impact, and we have two alum here to chat and to share their experiences with us, and I'd love to introduce them, our guests for this episode. So first, I'll introduce Lily Cam. She's a class of 2004, course 15 and CMS, Comparative Media Studies alumni. Um, she's a senior product manager at IM Plus, a technology company creating innovative wearable devices powered by artificial intelligence and founded by musician Will I Am. She also serves as advisor to the I Am Angel Foundation, a nonprofit that brings high impact STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, education programs to students in their underserved communities. In 2013, she co-founded Hack for LA. Maybe we have some participants on the line, um, an organization that brings Los Angeles's tech community together with city government to solve civic problems through utilizing open data and app development. Prior to joining, joining excuse me, I am plus, Lily worked in product management for tech companies in Beijing, China, and was a research fellow at the Tsinghua University Center for Future Media. Thank you for joining us, Lily. <laughs> I also have the pleasure of introducing David Sung Kong, who received his undergrad degree in 2001, course 10, and completed his graduate studies in the MIT Media Lab, receiving a master's and PhD for demonstrating the first gene synthesis in a microfluidic system. Um, I had to Google what most of those words meant. <laughs> <laughs> David is a synthetic biologist, community organizer, musician, and photographer. He is a pioneer in developing lab on a chip technologies for synthetic biology. Um, he's also the founder and director of EMW, an art technology and community center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. EMW's mission is to empower marginalized communities through the transformative power of artistic expression. He is currently the director of a new community biotechnology initiative at the Media Lab with a mission to empower communities around the world through biotech. Also with us tonight is Ellen Stahl, who heads up the MIT Alumni Association's alumni career programs, and she'll be our moderator. So Ellen, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Christina. And thanks so much to the MIT 10 committee for partnering on this program for your peers. So sadly, we're still in a pandemic. I don't have to tell you all that. Uh, that continues to impact and disrupt many of our best made plans. So. Uh, we apologize that Janet could not join us this evening as she sends her sincere regrets to all of you. And we hope that we'll be able to weave her in for a future program to learn about her career path that led her to the Gates Foundation. So apologies for that. But I'm so grateful to have Lily and David here with us tonight. No doubt hearing about their experiences. Um, we got to hear a little side chat of theirs um, before coming on live. Um, so you're in for a treat tonight. Uh, they'll provide interesting insights as we think about our own professional pathways. And for those of you who have attended before, you know that I'm a firm believer that when it comes to careers that we're still all in a state of constant evolution, and that might not mean a huge transition, it could mean deepening your own expertise or your focus. Um, and while for others, as Christina said, you know, it's the what's next. And sometimes that propels us forward with motivation and sometimes the not knowing sort of hits us like a roadblock. And in my many years of experience as a career counselor, I often find that talking to others like this, um, hearing different perspectives and gathering information similar to the methodology of research uh, where you're collecting the data and analyzing it and then synthesizing it for yourself 
um, those components often do help to make for better decisions and moves you forward. So let's dive right into the chats. Um, Lily, let's start off with you. Um, just to introduce yourself, I'm, obviously people have seen your bio, but can you give us sort of like just a brief timeline of your career path? Sure, and thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I always love talking to young alumni and also um, uh, to current students about my career path. So um, I have a pretty non, I think I have a pretty non-traditional career path for an MIT alum. Um, I was course 15 and I uh, double majored um, with CMS. Um, the year I graduated, 2004 was actually the first year that CMS became an undergraduate um, major option. So um, I, um, had always been interested in kind of um, new media and media technology. Um, actually had a Europe at the Media Lab as well as an undergrad. Um, was really lucky enough to um, uh, have a Europe under Gloriana Davenport. Um, she's not at the Media Lab um, anymore, but she had a group called Interactive Cinema. And like, you know, we did a lot of research projects around um, what does the cinema or storytelling of the future look like? So that was always like really interesting to me. Um, as a student at MIT, how like media and storytelling and entertainment can tie together. Um, so uh, when I graduated in 04, um, so uh, I was really bad at going to career fairs <laughs> and I did not have any internships with any companies um, because I chose to do Europe instead, pretty much all my summers I spent at the Media Lab, which was really awesome. Um, so uh, when I graduated, um, the grad student that I had worked under at the Media Lab um, uh, got his PhD in the same year. So we both graduated um, the same year and he getting his PhD, he decided to do a startup company um, afterwards. So um, I was lucky enough to kind of get a job offer from him because you know since we had worked together on Europe for so many years, he was like, hey, why don't you come work for my startup? Um, so uh, that was kind of my first job at MIT. Um, he was actually from Shanghai. Um, he was an international student from Shanghai. So his startup was actually, you know, based in China. Um, and it was a startup working on, um, um, at the time we were trying to create a product um, teaching Chinese uh, uh, speakers um, English. So it was like on a, you know, a language learning tool basically. So I was like, okay, cool. Like I didn't really have any other options. So um, that was my first job uh, working for an MIT, you know, founded startup. Um, so I actually moved to China for a couple of years to do that. And um, it was really overwhelming because um, my family is originally from China, but I, I don't, I didn't speak the language. So basically moving to a different country, um, working at a startup was really crazy as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, but I learned a lot. Um, I ended up staying in China for many years. Um, I ended up eventually uh, leaving that company and moving to Beijing. Um, and I got a, a different uh, a job opportunity there, basically. Um, I actually worked for Tsinghua University um, for a year. Um, Tsinghua is at basically the MIT of China. Um, a lot of, it's a, it's a very well-known university. Um, it's very technical. Um, so I worked at um, a lab there as a researcher for a little bit. And then eventually I started working for this other startup that was based in Beijing. Uh, Beijing is basically kind of like the Silicon Valley of China in the sense that a lot of tech companies are head headquartered out of uh, Beijing. And um, it was in Beijing that basically I, I got um, uh, that led me to my current job now. So um, currently, uh, I work for a celebrity, Will I Am with the Black Eyed Peas. He is a huge techie, which a lot of people might not know. Um, me and David were just talking because uh, David's kind of like familiar with my boss's work. Also, uh, Will actually visited MIT uh, a couple times um, back in the early two thousands, actually when the peas were kind of at their height of popularity. He actually sat in on a lot of classes and made friends with a lot of professors. So um, how I kind of ended up getting a job with him, um, and this is one of my most favorite stories to tell. Uh, I was working at the time for a company um, that was uh, sponsoring an event. Uh, I think this was in 2011 or something. Um, at the time, Will was actually a kind of cultural ambassador for the United States. 
So during the Obama um, administration, um, he got designated a cultural ambassador and one of his roles was to uh, go to China do, to do a concert. And at the time, the company I was with in China was one of the sponsors of the concert. So I got to go to the concert. I was basically working backstage and kind of like, um, kind of overseeing some stuff. And um, what happened was uh, how I kind of got to meet Will was um, his management um, uh, was freaking out about something backstage after the concert. So I went up to them and I, I said, um, hey, you know, I heard you guys are kind of uh, sound uh, worried about something. Is there anything I can help you with? And um, they said, yes, like we're, we're, we're kind of in a bind. Uh, we need help with something. Um, so they asked me, do you speak Chinese? And, and by then I, you know, I, I had learned Mandarin over time since I was living in China. So I was like, yes, I speak, I speak Chinese. Um, and then so, and then the next question for me was like, oh, do you know where um, Spark is? And Spark was basically the hottest nightclub in Beijing at the time. <laughs> and I said, yes, I, I know where that place is. And so they were like, oh, awesome. Like we, we need someone to, to take Will to Spark tonight. Um, <laughs> so uh, what, what happened was, um, whoever they had hired to kind of take, uh, you know, Will from point A to point B in the city um, had gone into some kind of fight with someone. So they got let go. And so they needed someone um, who basically could take Will and, and, and his team to this nightclub that night because Will had to DJ there. So I was like, yeah, that's definitely something I can help you guys with. And that's actually how I met him. And I ended up hanging out with him that night. <laughs> And, um, you know, Will being a huge tech fan as he is, he knew about MIT. I said, yeah, you know, I, you know, I went to MIT, I'm an MIT alum. And he, you know, was super happy about that. Um, and yeah, we just kind of like, you know, ended up kind of becoming friends that way. Um, but it wasn't until about a year later when um, I was trying to leave China and, you know, basically, you know, uh, establish a network back in the United States after working in China for so long. Um, I got reconnected to him and um, that's when he basically offered me a job because um, really because he just remembered me as the girl in China that helped him out and you know I was an MIT alum so that's kind of like the story of how I ended up uh, working for Will I Am. Um, and since then I've become uh, a product manager at his tech company. Um, product management was always kind of my background anyway. Uh, but how that kind of ties into social impact. Um, Will is also very passionate about um, philanthropy. So he has a nonprofit that um, I also help kind of um, manage and uh, create the strategy for. Um, and uh, we mostly support STEM education programs uh, for various um, underserved communities in Los Angeles. And um, so, yeah, and, I, and I've actually been in this job for about eight years now, which is like the longest I've ever had a job. <laughs> so that's basically my career path. That's great. That's great. That's a fun story. So I'm hearing a lot about you taking risks and obviously having enough gumption to like lift up your life and move to China, which is amazing um, and sticking with it and finding that you're absolutely fine and successful and timing sounds like a really key factor for you as well. Um, and just, you know, there's, but there's a lot of fearlessness there. You're just fearless, Lily. You're just like going for it. You're talking to people. You're just putting yourself out there. So I think that's really great. Um, thanks for sharing that. So David, your story I know is obviously different as everyone's story is unique. Um, I feel like what I know about you is that you basically grew up at MIT, which some people may not really know. Um, and you're still here, so you must really love it. Um, so what have gone into the various decisions that have led you through all of your degrees, all of your research? Has social impact always been something, have you always sort of like as a young child thought, I wanna do something that makes the world a better place or did these other things just come naturally in other, other ways? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. It's funny, um, I have been at MIT almost my entire life. So in some places, I, some ways I, I kind of grew up there and never left, which I'll explain in a moment. But um, I think uh, even though I've been at MIT both basically my entire kind of life and career, 
Um, what I've focused on and what I've cared about and how that's manifested in the world has changed dramatically, I think, over the years. And so maybe the, that story will be of interest to folks. Um, but yeah, my dad was a professor at MIT, a longtime professor, Professor Jin Al Kong. So he was uh, he joined the faculty in 1968. I think he was like 26 years old um, out of uh, Syracuse University and um, you know, showed up at MIT and, and got hired with, I think, like 11 other faculty. And he was the only one that got tenure out of that group. Um, so he basically was at MIT for about 40 years. He passed away in 2008. Um, so he was at the Research Laboratory of Electronics. And so I basically kind of grew up on campus. You know, I have like memories of like old Building 20 and like, you know, literally how the campus used to look, uh, you know, in the 80s and in the 90s. And so, uh, so I, I came to MIT in 1997 which feels like a very long time ago. It doesn't feel a long time ago to me, but I think for you all uh, probably feels like a long time ago. Um, and, um, and yeah, you know, I was chemical and engineering undergrad. I have to say um, my undergraduate, I really didn't know what I wanted to do or what was going on in my life <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, probably one of the most formative experiences I have actually at MIT was, uh, was singing in the, the MIT logarithms. That was a, a really impactful um, kind of experience that I had. Um, it, this is a whole nother conversation, but I, I didn't realize this at the time, but um, one thing I really cared about and, and actively do a lot of research uh, now in is, in is uh, collective intelligence and kind of organizational theory in a way. And a lot of that started actually in logarithms, which was this student group, but that, you know, we raised like $30,000 and built the whole studio and would, you know, arrange our own music, teach the music to ourselves, tour all around the country. And, you know, we had no help. I mean, it was just like a bunch of, of undergrads, like figuring all this stuff out. So it was a really momentous learning experience I had actually. Um, and that was very significant for me as an undergrad. And um, and my senior year, uh, like Lily, I, I also started a, a year up at the, uh, the Media Lab. I was working with Professor Joe Jacobson. He had developed um, e-ink technology. And so I started getting into uh, sort of microfabrication. And for my master's, I worked on nanotechnology research. So I was working with like electron beam, ion beam based lithography to make little 3D brains. That was kind of the goals. Like, can we grow these, grow these little 3D nanostructures and do computation with them? And so I have to say that that whole period um, while I was doing that research, it was something I was excited about, but it wasn't something I necessarily felt was like my life's passion. You know, it was like something I was like, okay, this is something I can do, but it wasn't necessarily, I think, if I had the full alignment. I don't know um, if, if you all are familiar with this uh, concept called Ikigai. It's this, uh, I'm seeing a lot of head nods. For those of you who aren't, it's very quickly, it's, uh, it's sort of a, um, a framework thinking about your life and your career. And the, the basic idea is that if you have these kind of four areas satisfied, then you've got a pretty harmonious career. And those four areas are basically, it's, it's um, your job is something that you're good at. It's something that you're passionate about. It's something that you can make a living off of. And it's something that's good for the world. And if you have all four of those things, it's like harmony, right? Um, I feel very lucky in that that's something that I have right now, um, but it took me a long time to kind of figure out how to get there. Um, but um, anyway, so I, I was doing this technical work at the Media Lab, did my master's, and then I started doing my PhD. And a lot of it, honestly, I was kind of in this academic path um, a lot of it was just because, you know, I had such great role models in my parents. You know, my dad was a professor. My mom was also a professor at, at UMass Boston um, teaching statistics. So, so I sort of was like, okay, well, you know, this feels like a good thing to do. My sister went and got her PhD. So I was like, okay, I'll continue to do grad school. And it wasn't really until I was doing my PhD that I think I started to really figure out what my passions were. Um, when I was doing my PhD, um, this was in, it was started in about 2003, 2004. Um, you know, the Iraq war had started, uh, was in 2003, and George Bush got reelected in 2004, which at the time felt, to me, really terrible. This was like, you know, we'd gotten into this really terrible war. And then uh, after Bush got reelected, I remember feeling really pretty devastated and had my first like panic attacks, anxiety attacks. And then I really started getting basically into politics around that time. So, you know, while I was doing my PhD, which was also an interesting period, because that was basically the, the start of this field called synthetic biology was being born basically at MIT and, and other campuses um, in the early 2000s. And so I, in my technical life, I started applying a lot of the microfabrication I learned in my master's to actually doing uh, synthetic biology research. So working on microfluidics and lab on a chip technology and all of this kind of very cutting edge synthetic biology. But at the same time, I was like, getting very, very into social justice, very into um, political uh, economy. I, I almost dropped out of MIT or, or shifted my career focus. I was like, I just want to study political economy. I just want to read about, you know, why the world is the way the world is, you know? 
And so around 2005, myself and a bunch of other uh, community organizers, we started organizing a variety of community arts events and social justice activities. So my family had this old Chinese language bookstore that was like right on Mass Ave in between uh, Harvard and Central Square. It's called East Meets West Bookstore. And um, we took it over because um, it was you know, selling Chinese language books, which is not necessarily the most profitable business, as you might imagine. And, um, and we took it over and we started hosting open open mics. And, you know, one of the kind of things I realized um, early in the 2000s was um, the, the power and liberatory power of artistic expression, you know, what it means to be able to share your own narrative, to have agency and, and a voice, you know, and we were organizing these, uh, these open mics primarily for the Asian American uh, community. But then it started kind of getting bigger and bigger and all kinds of folks from different uh, kind of marginalized backgrounds started coming to our space because we created this really powerful platform and venue for, for expression. And so over the years um, in the 2000s, um, basically I worked to kind of grow that, that community space. And we started out initially with one program, this open mic. And then over the years, we started adding all of these other things. We started doing salons, we started doing um, a gallery, um, we started doing um, poetry and, and uh, you know, hip hop nights. And we had this program called East Meets Beats with all these electronic music producers. So we kind of started expanding all of these different forms of artistic expression. And, um, and then at the same time, I was basically kind of in this cutting edge, uh, you know, synthetic biology career, but I had these like two separate lives. And I remember very distinctly um, thinking to myself that um, people at the Media Lab or at MIT would not, would not want to know that I cared about social justice or cared about the arts. I remember distinctly one time I had like printed out some posters for like some event and somebody had put on my poster like this note, like do not print these here, you know? So I had this like kind of internalized to myself, like, okay, actually I need to keep my technical career separate from all of these other interests that I had. And around that time too, I started getting into, you know, DJing and photography. Those became like a couple of big hobbies of mine. And I remember distinctly in 2010, so I'd finished my PhD at that point. And, you know, I think I mentioned my, my dad had passed away, which was a had a really big impact on me. And I was really kind of depressed for a couple of years, even though like from outward appearances, it's like, oh, this guy's, you know, got his PhD from the media lab and he's, you know, doing this postdoc and all this stuff. But I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I actually almost gave up my career in science to pursue something like, you know, DJing and photography or something that I, you know, kind of got pretty good at, but was just like, I was just a little lost. And I remember in 2010, I, um, I a friend of mine who had just was a, a friend of mine from MIT, who was a, an, also an alum, was doing a startup and um, had a, was working on basically a cancer diagnostic startup and was like, hey, you know, he had just like won the 100K or done like very well. And it was like, hey, do you want to work with me on this, this venture? And I didn't really have a lot of other things going on at the time. So I said, okay, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll do it. And so this is, I think, a lesson too, and maybe kind of relates to some of what Lily was sharing. You know, I think when you're, the people that you surround with, you're, you surround yourself with, there's such a massive influence on just how your career unfolds, you know? And I remember I was kind of in this state where I, I was sort of like sitting on my couch, not kind of sure what I wanted to do. And my friend was like kind of moving 10,000 miles an hour, like, hey, we got to do this, we got to do that. And so even though I kind of knew like long-term, you know, we probably weren't the best fit, you know, doing a startup together is like a relationship, it's like a marriage, you know, you want to you have all of the stars aligned. But um, that particular year of my life, I think like really turned my whole life and career around because all of a sudden I got activated. I remember I was going, um, I remember the exact day actually, it was like June 15th in 2010. I was coming out to the West Coast. I had decided, okay, I'm gonna do this startup. And then I'd also decided I'm gonna turn this just storefront activity into a whole community center. I was like, I'm gonna turn this whole building into an art technology community center. I don't know how I'm gonna do it or like what the details are gonna be, but I'm gonna do these two things. And I remember I went out to the West Coast and I basically like set up meetings every single day. I was like, all right, I'm gonna to talk to every single person that I know that has interest in art, in startups, in cancer diagnostics, in microfluidics, in community centers. It's just like kind of any interest that crossed those two project ideas that I was interested in. And I started meeting with people like every single day. And I remember like, like a month into it, I like suddenly was just this, I, I become like a different person. All of a sudden I was just like, had so much agency in my life and was just filling myself with so much learning from all these people. And basically, you know, over the years since then, right, so this is the past 10 years, um, which is basically my 30s, I kind of learned how to like manifest these things into the world and how to merge all of my interests. So I stopped hiding anymore. I was like, okay, I'm a DJ. I love DJing. I'm the DJ everywhere. And I basically became like, you know, I don't, some of you may be familiar with iGEM. It's the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, which is a really big 
institution in, in synthetic biology. Thousands of students participate in that every year. And I became like the official iGEM DJ. So I would like rock a party at the Heinz Convention Center with like 3,000 students. And, you know, I would be like the main headline DJ, you know. Um, and, you know, over time, as I started to merge my interests in arts and sciences, um, you know, like Lily, like over the years, I've, I've been, done some really cool, like interesting collaborations. Like I, I um, uh, this was since I started my job at the Media Lab. There's one other chapter I'll, I'll come back to very quickly, but, um, you know, I worked with uh, like DJ Jazzy Jeff, for example, where, uh, you know, I was speaking at this event as, as Jeff and, um, you know, we had done this project called Biota Beats, where we basically take samples of the human microbiome and turn those, uh, the data from the microbiome into sound and music. So we're basically making hip hop beats out of people's bacteria. And, um, you know, so I, I you know, Will, uh, uh, J DJ Jazzy Jeff and I were speaking at this event and, and I set up a little, a little um, kind of lab in the green room and I was like, hey, Jeff, you know, we're making, we're making hip hop beats out of bacteria. Can I, can I sample some of your, your microbes? And, and he was like, dude, this is the weirdest, you know, question anybody's ever asked me, but yes, you can, you can have my bacteria, you know? And so I've got these really funny pictures of me, like sampling, uh, you know, DJ Jazzy Jeff's microbes. And um, we ended up doing this like, you know, big collaboration together and, uh, you know, turned it into a really cool, cool project. But, you know, my, my meta lesson here is basically just, you know, um, all of you have your own kind of interests and the things that you care about. And I think there's a magic that can happen if you really allow those, those, um, those things that you care about to flourish and, and express themselves in different ways and different unexpected ways. Because for myself, basically, you know, after I kind of did this startup for a little while, I joined Lincoln Lab at MIT, where I, I helped to found a synthetic biology center. For five years, I was still working again, very technical synthetic biology, but my arts and uh, technology center was taking off. So I kind of had Ikigai, but in two jobs, right? Because I was doing like this impactful social justice community arts thing, and I was doing this hardcore, um, you know, technical thing. And basically, I, I ultimately combined them in, in the, the lab that I now lead at the Media Lab, which is basically the intersection of those two things. So it's like exploring equity and justice, but in the context of biotech, and also about you know, artistic expression and how do we communicate science and get as much broad participation in science from all these diverse communities all around the world. So this is part of our, our pre-talk with Lily. I was like, oh yeah, you know, because we're working on this whole diversity and leadership program now. So you know, wouldn't it be great to get you know, Will I am involved and et cetera. And so over the years, you know, I've had the real, real amazing opportunity to work with, you know, people like, you know, Jalen Brown from the Boston Celtics, you know, we collaborate on this whole learning and education program or, or Diplo, who's become a friend, who's a music producer, who I met DJing parties at Burning Man. But then when the pandemic happened, um, we started doing weekly science communication events. So we would do like Instagram lives and like we would hop on and talk to his, you know, millions of followers all about COVID. So so all of that kind of unfolded, I think, after I really embraced these different parts of my personality and then over time kind of figured out how to weave them into a career, which um, right now for me at the Media Lab, you know, directing this research group is something that I feel is kind of like a dream job and it's something that um, I'm really, really thrilled to have here at MIT. So, so I never left MIT, but I think I went on a pretty big journey along the way, yeah, <laughs> in for short. Sure. For sure. And, and lots of similarities with you and Lily in the sense of it's, you know, I mean, there's a lot of fearlessness, right? So you were fearless, you sort of went for it. There was this sort of, again, with like with Lily, she had a you know, working with someone who had a startup, it sort of brought her and she wasn't sure what she was going to do. And you almost had a friend who freed you from what you felt like was the restrictiveness of your path with that startup. And maybe the startup space sort of was innovative enough to be accepting in your mind of all the other things that you wanted to do and that wasn't as cookie cutter maybe as that research life. Um, so that's really interesting. And I, I don't think I've ever thought I would hear the phrase hip hop beats out of bacteria. Was that what you were saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, my mind is blown now. I can go home. Um, that's amazing. So. I think we all have a good understanding of how um, interesting the work and lives um, are of David and Lily. And I, I want to get down to some sort of like actionable things here. Um, I do want to hear about your work um, and the audience I'm sure wants to hear about your work too, but I'm, I want to, don't want to lose sight of the sort of the, the advice aspect here, which is, um, you know, for audience members who might be thinking especially after the year that we've all experienced. Um, I want a career change, but I want to do something that's going to make the world a better place um, because I'm not happy with what's happened. Um, and maybe, or maybe they're already making the world a better place, but they want to find ways to make a stronger impact. 
So what's the advice that you would give someone who's either on the outside looking in, thinking about a job in these areas? Um, what do people need to know? What do they need to consider or research first? Do they need to be an insider? Do they need to have been doing all sorts of like, you know, good things and volunteering all their lives? Um, or is, is it just like any other job search? Um, we did get a, a question from someone before the program, Alicia, I'm not sure if you're here. Um, I'll try to do your, your question justice. Um, sort of, you know, like advice for networking with others in this area of work given the current job climate. So right now we're in a pandemic, a lot of companies are having hiring freezes, a lot of organizations are not hiring, they're making you do even more work. So how do you suggest navigating this space right now for people who are looking to get in or to make a change? I'll lob that to Lily. Yeah, I'm happy to chime in first. Um, but first of all, uh, I really enjoyed hearing David's story actually. And um, I see a lot of similarities to my story. And just a quick note, I feel like in the last 10 years, it's become more in vogue to be like a multi hyphenate, like, don't hide the fact that you're a DJ, all the stuff that you're doing outside is actually really cool. And it's another opportunity to network with a whole crowd of people that you might not normally network with. So I just wanted to um, give a shout out to that. Um, but basically, so to the question, how do you get into maybe working into social impact space, um, I would suggest, like, maybe figuring out what causes you're especially passionate about and also um, start volunteering on certain grassroots efforts because there's no shortage of grassroots, uh, you know, um, organizing out there right now, like especially in this past year because of COVID and also because of uh, um, the social, the, the civil rights, you know, uh, protests. Um, uh, for you know, uh, you know, people of color and minorities, there's just so much work that's out there right now, and it's a lot of it is grassroots, basically. So I would probably suggest someone start to start looking into that, how they can contribute to those causes, meeting the people in that space, seeing what work, work is being done. Um, you know, if you don't enjoy doing the work for free, you're probably not going to enjoy doing that work, getting paid either. <laughs> so instead of just starting to apply for jobs where you might not have any experience in the space. Go ahead and volunteer and see how much you like it. Um, there are also a lot of opportunities within corporations, I feel, to um, work on, um, you know, uh, uh, CSR related initiatives, especially, you know, for MIT alums who are already at, at like uh, major companies, uh, bigger companies, you know, whether you're in business or engineering, um, a lot of major companies also have uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives. So that's something that you can maybe start looking into volunteering for and maybe pivot towards that space if you're that's what re you're really passionate about. Um, so that's another suggestion um, I would make. I've met a lot of folks who work for big companies like, um, you know, for Facebook, Microsoft, uh, uh, Salesforce, um, Mark Benioff, the head of Salesforce, he's incredibly philanthropic. Um, you know, a lot of these organizations do have people who are working in the social impact space already. And I, that's just another source of um, networking that you might be able to do in that space to see how you can pivot into it if you're really interested. Um, and yeah, like that's, that's probably the top of my mind when it comes to su uh, suggestions for someone who, who's interested in getting into that space. David? Any additional advice or different thoughts or maybe different pathways or anything specific <clears throat> about the, you know, the right now navigating with, you know, approaching someone at an organization when they may be in a hiring freeze? What's the best way to go about that? Yeah, I mean, I think Lily's suggestions were, were really fantastic and, and spot on. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, just one thing to recognize, you know, all of us being alums from MIT, you know, we, we, we really, all of us are so extraordinarily privileged to have, to be a part of this incredible alumni network, to have access to so many fabulous resources. And, um, you know, I think, I think that's not to be overlooked. And you have so many, like at your fingertips, you have so many amazing ways to kind of um, get access to all kinds of interesting projects and things that are happening around the world. And so I think, you know, to agree very much with Lily, um, you know, 
to the extent that you can even start volunteering or finding causes that you care about and are able to work on them, even in, you know, kind of nights and weekends, if you, even if while you're doing something else, I think that is a great place to start. I think I was describing, you know, I, I kind of worked on this community center for about, you know, like 10 years, the same time I had another job. <laughs> you know what I mean, so I was like, I, I basically had two jobs. I had like a, you know, very demanding technical job at the same time I was directing a, a whole community space in the nights and weekends. And it was kind of funny because the people at my community center would like protest the people that I, you know, Lincoln Lab is like a Department of Defense funded laboratory. And I had like, you know, artists against police violence, like in my community space. So they would like protest the people I work with at the daytime, you know? So anyways, um, I, I think I think expo exposing yourself, much like when you're an, an undergrad, you know, I still advise like MIT undergrads now. And I think it's just true throughout life. I mean, you know, you have to follow your passion, like the things that, you know, in somewhere inside you, you know, the things that you care about and get excited about. And I think, you know, trusting your natural enthusiasm is so important in life. I mean, I think that's like maybe the most important career advice for anybody at any time. It's just like, what, what is really making you excited? You know, I know I, I, I'm as part of my own regular practice, I'm asking that myself basically daily about all the projects I'm working on. I might've been working, like, I haven't talked about a lot of the stuff I'm doing now, but you know, there's some project, projects that I've worked on for like four or five years now that have been like amazing, big now insta international institutions, but it's like, do I still personally like Am I still so motivated to like continue to drive this thing? Or is it time to like kind of hand it off? Is it time to kind of like bud this thing out and have other people take it and run with it? So I think it's, you know, figuring out what that passion is, is always like top priority, no matter where you are. But then I think as you're trying to get into a space like social impact, as Lily said, I mean, she, I think she did an amazing job outlining the different ways. I mean, there's so many opportunities and especially right now, I mean, if you have time and that's probably your most critical resource, if it's something you care about, you'll make time for it anyways, right? This is what I've learned in life. So, so take that time and, and, you know, dive in. I mean, literally, you know, you being an MIT alum, that'll get you into a lot of doors just saying like, Hey, you know, I care about the space. I've got XYZ skills and I'd love to help. And, you know, if you continue to follow those threads, it'll take you to some of the most interesting places that you can imagine, as long as you have that curiosity and that enthusiasm. That's great. That's really helpful. So um, we got another question from um, someone who registered is, and I apologize in advance if I say your name wrong, is, um, is Chalette here? And if you are, do you want to come off microphone and camera and ask your question? Chalette, Chalette, I'm not sure if the pronunciation is right. Or I can ask the question for you if you prefer. Oh, you, um, you can ask for me. I don't remember it. Thanks. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you can come off camera if you want. It's up to you. Um, so I thought this was a good question. Um, and you sort of touched upon this, Lily, which was um, what's the best way to find socially oriented careers with a competitive salary? Is it possible? <laughs> Great question. I mean, I mean, that's like the million dollar question, right? It like, is, right? It's a fair question. What, <laughs> um, like, uh, yeah, I mean, well paying jobs, uh, corporate route, I guess, working for a big company like a Facebook or a Microsoft or a Salesforce, someone that has a budget that to, to do for roles that, you know, you're basically being paid to figure out how a company can become more responsible or how to support certain social causes. Um, uh, private foundations, um, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, I know there was another alum who works for the Gates Foundation that wasn't able to join today, but um, high profile foundations like that, network with people in that space. Like David said, use your MIT, name drop MIT to see if you can get your foot through the door, at least in networking with these folks and, uh, you know, asking, uh, you know, what opportunities there are starting to establish a relationship with them. Um, it's probably not too different from networking for any other job, a high paying job, quite honestly. Um, uh, me, I have a non-traditional route. I kind of got in through the door with a celebrity who's really passionate about philanthropy. Um, so if you, I don't know, work in, if you have an opportunity to work on stuff that could be adjacent to high net worth individuals uh, who do philanthropy, that could be another way to kind of network your way in. Um, you know, obviously if you're going to go that route um, and interview with these folks, they'll probably want at least to know 
uh, you know, they're going to need to be convinced uh, that you're the right person for the role, right? So it helps to have some background in working on social impact. <laughs> so whether it's volunteer, the way, you know, David did for a really long time, um, or, um, I mean, you just have to show that you're, you're really passionate about a certain cause and you're the right person to, um, you know, to get the job done, whatever, you know, that, that role may be. Um, so yeah, I would say it's, it's not too different from networking for any other job really, but, um, just, you know, making sure that you can prove that you have the passion and the right skills to, you know, work in that space. Great. David, do you have any secret like roles that are at various places <laughs> that, that are, are high paying or competitive wages? Yeah. Yeah, well, or is that I think just again, something that just doesn't align with this this space? And if that's the case, that's okay. It would just be good to know, I think, for most people. Oh, there, there are definitely you know high paying jobs that you can get in social impact uh, for sure. Again, I, I feel very lucky to have you know a job you know at, at the media lab right now, where I think is you know I have a very competitive salary. Um, now it's not you know I'm not like doing a startup in tech you know so I don't have it's it's very different from that, but. Um, but, you know, I think you can very, ha you know, have a very comfortable um, life working in social impact if you are attached to the right type of institution, right? So this is actually kind of interesting, right? Like there was a period where I was really debating like, hey, you know, would I want to pursue EMW, like the community center full time and had that be like my home base? And I was actually choosing between that or the, the media lab job, actually. I was like, because both of those things were kind of taking off and I, and I really could pick one or the other. And I ultimately, in a way, made a safer choice by going to the media lab because at the end of the day, that is MIT, right? It's like a very, it's a very different proposition to be a part of like this giant kind of aircraft carrier that's got, you know, an HR department and healthcare and all of this stuff compared to actually having to go and, and set that and build all of that for myself, you know, externally. Now, um, I think, you know, there, there's a version of my life, you know, in the multiverse, there's, there's some version of me that went that route and has probably learned a lot and, you know, struggled and tried to, you know, figure out how to raise funding and so on. Um, but I think, you know, this goes back to still, I think what, what, um, you know, both Lily and I have been saying, which I think is, you know, you have to, you have to really figure out what's for you. And you, you, it's hard to know what's for you until you really like try a bunch of things. Um, but I do think though, once you kind of have a vision for it, I, I definitely believe in the power of visualization. Like I definitely believe it's important to kind of like close your eyes and imagine like yourself in certain situations. Like I remember, um, you know, when I was kind of giving my first job talk at the media lab, even like I like visualized that talk for a long time. Like I visualized what it would feel like to like give like the kind of closing part of that talk and like how I wanted the audience to feel. Um, with my community center, I remember, you know, when, when I, I, I went through like a couple of like assistant directors, cause you know, I had a full-time job. So I needed to find somebody that would, that um, I could work with that could really take on a lot of the responsibilities during the daytime while I was working my, my, uh, my Lincoln lab job. And I remember like walking around, her name was Monique. She was like the first like, kind of partner that I had working on this. And we were walking around the building and we were like, just close your eyes. I can imagine what it would be like when this is filled with people. Like imagine this is filled with kids, like, you know, young people working in here, the gallery space is over here, the recording studio is over here. And we would imagine it. You literally kind of like imagine what that would look like. And um, I've done that at various points in my life. And I, I think it's like a really powerful exercise because like once you can kind of see it for yourself, you're like, yes, like, and then it's sort of like, well, how do I get there? You know, another really quick, funny story about visualization. I mean, I'm a huge Celtics fan. I'm a huge basketball fan. And I remember when Jalen Brown, you know, got drafted by the Celtics and I was reading about him and it was this kid that cared about social justice and was into the arts and like language and all this stuff. I was like, this kid doesn't know it yet but he is going to be a director's fellow at the media lab. Like he just is, he's just so perfect for this. I don't know how I'm going to figure out how to meet him or connect with him, but I'm going to make it happen. And like, just over the course of a couple of years, I like somehow figured out how to become friends with the guy that became his manager. And then me and that guy became friends. And then I was like, Rudy, dude, like we got to get Jalen into the lab. How do we make it possible? I went to a talk that Jalen had at Harvard at, at, um, at the education school, asked a question there. So we started to know each other a little bit. And then once I got him to come to MIT, we like gave him a, did a whole talk and a big tour. And then it was like, he got it. He was like, this place is amazing. Like, how do I get more involved? I'm like, yes, dude, you do it through this fellowship. And then kind of like the rest is history. You know, like Jalen and I, he's like one of my closest friends now, like, which is weird to say, because I was his huge, hugest fan for years. But again, it was just sort of like imagining myself, like, I don't know how I'm going to have, I'm going to make this happen, but Jalen has got to be a fellow at the lab. It was just like, I became possessed with that idea. And then it was just like, how do you, how do you make it happen for yourself? So I think that imagination part is really critically important. You got to like kind of see where you want to go to kind of build the bridges to get there. Yeah, you call it imagination. I see it as fearless. 
again, it's just like, you're just going for it, right? You're just, you're figuring out how to get over the fact that you're going to talk to people about stuff that you're passionate about and you may not know all the answers and you're looking for information and you're just, you're driving it. And that's, that's really empowering. So, um, but I think if you can't find the things that are really important to you, it's harder to, to manifest that energy behind, behind yeah. what you want to do next. Right. I, I would say though, I, I don't know, you know, how, how you feel about this Lily, but I definitely have fear all the time. So I, I definitely don't consider myself to be fearless. Like, I feel like I, I, I have all kinds of fear that comes up a lot of the times, but actually I feel like there's a, um, a very healthy type of fear that um, I think is actually almost an important feature of, of my life, which is, which comes with challenge, right? I think there are, you know, I remember like the first time I taught a, cl a grad class at MIT, this was like in 2014, maybe. And, you know, I, I had just finished grad school, like maybe like a handful of years ago. And it's like, I'm supposed to be teaching like these, these students that are like basically my age and like way smarter than I am. And I'm the teacher, you know? And I remember like the first time teaching that class, I had to overcome so many different fears to just get myself to like, feel like, hey, I can do this or I belong. You know, there's kind of imposter syndrome. It's like, how could I be the one teaching these kids? And then, you know, after you do it the first time, then it's like, okay, like that wasn't so bad or it even went really great or it was better than I thought it would be. And now, you know, I teach grad students at MIT all the time and I don't think about it, but like the first time I taught it, it was like incredibly scary. And so I find for myself at each stage of my life, my career, I'm always doing something that scares me. Like I'm always, there's always something that I'm doing like, man, like, I don't know how this is going to work out. Like I've never done this before. It's going to be weird, but like, you know, kind of screw it. So, so there is a fearlessness in the sense that like you embrace it, but it's also because I feel like there's um, like a formula that, that basically is like, you become more extraordinary in your life when you challenge yourself and you overcome challenges. Like you, you face something that you don't think you can do and then you struggle through it. And then at the end of it, you're like, holy crap, I actually climbed that thing. I like did that thing I didn't think I could do. And now you've got, you've like built some muscles, you know, you've like kind of like, you know, pushed yourself and now you, you, you got through the other side. So I think that cycle is really, really important um, in, in your life and your career. I, I agree. 100%. Yeah, I want to. Yeah, I want to add to that, actually, what yeah. David was saying um, about um, fear and also putting yourself in the right situation and also like, um, for example, um, you know, it's, I know it sounds crazy because, you know, both David and I, you know, work with celebrities or have some kind of celebrity component or these kind of like high profile individuals, but um, like, it's also like putting yourself, because I'm sure someone in the audience is like, well, how am I supposed to get to who I am? Or how am I supposed to get to, you know, so-and-so, right? So, but like, it's, it's, it's a matter of putting yourself in the right situations too. Like, for example, I was working for a tech company in China that happened to sponsor this event. And, you know, I, you know, tried to, I always like to be as friendly and like, uh, you know, um, outgoing as possible, even though I'm, I consider myself an introvert, but I like to put myself out there because I do enjoy meeting people and I enjoy helping people. So it's about putting yourself in the right situations too, to be helpful or to be of use to someone. So, um, and just, you know, tying in with, with what David said about fear. I remember when I saw Will's management kind of freaking out about something, I definitely hesitated in approaching them. Cause I was like, oh, should I interrupt them? Like they seem kind of stressed out. But I was like, I mean, these these are important people. I, I should help out if if I can. So there's that internal dialogue going on constantly. <laughs> so and obviously I'm glad I did because it actually ended up lead, leading leading me to a job. So um, for me, it's about making sure you're putting yourself in the right situations. Um, you know, speaking out um, whenever you can, even though it might feel kind of scary, just do it. Um, easier, probably easier said than done, but. Um, you know, with the fear, with, with the whole fear stuff, I can guarantee you that 90% of the time, a lot of people like aren't really thinking about whether or not you're going to embarrass yourself or not. And even if you do, like, they don't really care. <laughs> so it's really, it's really just an internal thing. You just have to get over that fear. Um, so, uh, and, um, and yeah, like, uh, you know, I, I saw someone in the comments talking about imposter syndrome. I mean, definitely. I think that's definitely a lot of people, a, a lot of things that people deal with. But um, most of the time, you know, people don't really know what they're doing. And they're all also just trying to figure it out <laughs> along the way, which is what I've discovered after, you know, many years of being in the industry and, and whatnot. Right. So um, and uh, and yeah, like, um, don't be afraid to go out there. Um, actually, what David said also about putting your like 
uh, you know, doing something that makes you uncomfortable, like that's actually really important. Um, all the times where I've done something that I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm going to just try anyway. That's actually when you're learning the most. Um, and I would actually go as far to say that if you're not doing something that makes you uncomfortable, you're, 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 you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not in a place of growth basically. So, um, so yeah, I would encourage anyone to kind of try to, you know, get into that space and, and try it out and you're, you might actually see really great results. That's great. I'm just going to I'm just going to applaud there. Those were some really awesome, just transparent, honest um, pieces of wisdom, and I really appreciate you both sharing that. That's great because um, I know that everyone does feel that way, and it often comes off as you know, like, wow, I don't know how I can do that, or yeah, it seems so easy for them. And so, thanks for sort of being vulnerable and and putting it out there. Um, I know that we probably have some other questions um from folks and i want to make this as valuable for the 33 of you that are sitting with us tonight um I, there was one question from let's see heading back to the chat do do from jonathan jonathan do you want to come off uh mute and ask your question sure thing no problem can you hear me okay yeah yeah we hear you Right on. Um, basically, the thing that I want to know uh, is you were chosen to be the speakers at this, and I am so grateful to have the privilege to have seen this email last night in the middle of the night. But, um, you know, <laughs> the thing that I like to know about people who are actively out there and exposing themselves to opportunity and figuring out, you know, what's going on in the world is like, what are you paying attention to that I'm not paying attention to that I should be paying attention to? And like, hmm. obviously, I can't tell you all the things that I am looking at or that you're looking at, but you know, what's super important that you feel like the 30, whatever of us in this room should totally go look up or learn something about. Mm. Well, maybe, maybe one quick thing um, uh, to answer your question, but also connecting to something that um, Lily was saying earlier. Um, I, I fully agree with Lily's observation that um, people that look like they have it all figured out do not have it figured out. I think that's like a massive thing to understand about no matter who the person is, they may be at the very top of their craft and you think are just this unassailable like, you know, figure. And I guarantee you that person is like also confused and is like figuring it out. You know, we're all like, I, I started realizing this the more I started to talk, talk to like the mentors that I had, I was like, wow, like, you know, I thought you had it all figured out. It's like, no, I, I don't, I don't have it figured out. And like the people that, you know, I have students that look up to me and they're like, oh, you must have it all figured out. I'm like, I definitely do not have it all figured out. So, so I think, um, you know, one, one kind of process observation that might be useful, Jonathan. So one is get yourself some great mentors. I think that's like a, one of the most important things you can do in your life and your career is make sure that you have great mentors. So, um, you know, this sort of goes back to an earlier comment about just like, who are you surrounding yourself with? And like, who are you spending your time with? Um, I, I think that there's this incredible virtuous cycle that you get from both uh, surrounding yourself with great mentors, but then also having a mentoring, having like opportunities to, to mentor those um, uh, those that may be looking up to you. Um, again, in my job, I feel very lucky because, you know, I, I work with, with uh, you know, MIT grad students and undergrads and in my community space, I work with young people all the time um, and in the global uh, kind of organizing that I do. So I'm doing a lot of mentoring, but then I also have these amazing mentors. So there's, I think putting yourself into that virtuous cycle is like really, really important. Um, and if you feel like that's something that you're not, you don't have either way, um, I think it's, it's, it's really valuable to do that. Um, I think the other thing that's really important too is, um, if, and this is less about a specific thing to look at, but more like um, in a way, how is it that certain people or certain groups become excellent? And I guess what I mean by that is, um, you know, so so I've realized for myself over time that, you know, while I started out kind of narrow, narrowly focused in synthetic biology, actually a huge amount of my passion is in culture. It's actually about like kind of art science, like the intersection between art, science, design, and engineering, which is also why the Media Lab has been such a great fit for me. But one thing I've realized too, like over time is that, you know, when you kind of figure out how to be successful at a thing, it almost doesn't matter what the thing is. It's like what the most important thing you're learning is actually how to be successful, right? So, so one example is like in your PhD, right? Like when I did my PhD and I think anybody that does their PhD, um, it's a, it can be a great thing to do, but the domain knowledge of the thing you learn is like cool, but the most important thing you're learning in your PhD is actually how to learn. You're like learning, like, how do I actually like teach myself how to run experiments and like figure out how to like, you know, you know, you know, kind of develop the tools of my quest for knowledge type of thing, right? 
like one quick story, like um, this, this, this dance crew in LA that I'm like a massive fan of this group called the Kinja. So again, this is another kind of funny thing. I was like, I'm a huge fan of these guys. They're amazing dancers. I don't know how or why I would ever work with them, but I just love them. And I think they're so cool. I ended up at this event where um, the manager of the Kinjas was at the event. And I was like, my God, like I immediately went over. was like, you guys are amazing. Da, da, da. We exchanged information brought them over to the media lab and gave them a tour. And we were like, hey, great. Let's figure out how to work together. And then when the pandemic hit, we like, again, it was like, all right, well, you guys are this, this cultural force there in the Kinjas as a dance group, their, their, uh, their kind of insignia is a mask. They have a face covering with their logo on it. And they've had that their whole kind of career as dancers. So I was like, we got to do something around science communication and around mask wearing and so on. And so we ended up, there was this big um, campaign that we worked on called beat the virus that was uh, launched out of the lab, media lab at MIT, where we were engaging with, with a social, a social, uh, media influencers to get them to leverage their platforms to do science communication. And so we had the Kinjas do this whole like dance thing where they like, where they basically, um, they did a dance to um, Samuel Jackson's um, Stay the F at Home. And then that became like a viral dance video that they launched, you know, all of them doing this, this dance that the Kinjas were uh, choreographed. And so I was like, like amazing. Like now I'm working with the Kinjas on this thing. Then the Kinjas launched a noodle product. They like, were like, we're dancers, but then they went into noodles, right? Which was like, what are these guys doing going into noodles? But the noodle product is like amazing, right? And the reason the noodle product is amazing is because they know how to be amazing dancers, right? So it's like, my point is just like, once you kind of get into the realm of like working with people that know how to be excellent at a thing, that's like the key learning. You're like, you figure out like, oh, like this is how they organize themselves. This is how they think. These are the people they surround themselves. This is how they structure things, right? And so once you kind of can get yourself in an environment like that, then you can really start to learn. And then you can start applying those learnings to other spaces, which I think like I've been very lucky to be in a variety of those different types of settings to soak in that type of, you know, I guess like excellence wisdom, you know? So hopefully that that's helpful, Jonathan. That was great. That was really great. Lily, I don't know if you had anything to add. No, and that that was great. I mean, just to add to what David was saying, also like the landscape is always changing too. Like talk about excellence or success, like social media is changing like every year. TikTok wasn't a thing two years ago and now it's like the biggest thing. There's a lot of opportunity to learn things that your mentors might not even know about, right? Um, I definitely think you should get mentors, but um, also like kind of take advantage of how quickly technology is like changing and try to kind of study that also. And you might get some insights that other people might not know about because it's so new that, you know, they haven't really looked into it. Um, you know, working for Will, you know, he's a musician and, you know, musicians still do have to do a lot of things like promote their music, right? And so, um, you know, social media has changed so much over the last five, five years that, they're constantly thinking of like, what can we do next? Because what works, what worked 10 years ago doesn't work anymore. So it's also kind of like, can you study what's going on right now that, you know, tradition, like, you know, uh, in industries or, you know, uh, don't just can't grasp because they're not fast enough. Um, what can you learn about that? And maybe also uh, bring to the conversation, whatever project that you might be working on. Great, thanks Lily. So I know that we obviously don't have enough time for either of you to tell us all about what you're doing <laughs> in your work. Um, but if you were to pick, each of you to pick one thing that you're hoping will come from your work this year that will make things a little better uh, in the spaces that you're working, what would you want the audience to know about? Um, and then, you know, package that sort of tightly and then we'll kick it over to Christina and she can um, hopefully get some more questions um, from the audience while you're answering this question. They can pop some more into the chat. Who wants to go first? I think you choose, Ellen. Me? Okay, I'm gonna go to <laughs> Lily. Ladies first. Oh yeah, no problem. Um, I guess a quick thing that I'm working on right now is, um, so uh, I mentioned Will's nonprofit is, Mostly, um, we're focused on uh, supporting uh, schools and underserved communities, uh, providing more STEM education uh, resources to those schools. Uh, right now, um, since the pandemic happened, there is gonna be a huge educational crisis. Uh, a lot of students who are forced to learn at home, uh, students from low-income families who whose parents are maybe essential workers or who may have lost jobs during the pandemic, um, 
they're really not doing well at, at home, the learning at home stuff. Um, so right now we're trying to figure out how best we can help those students. Uh, students may have been set back by as much as one full academic year because of the work from home situation from, from certain communities, just because they don't have the same access as wealthier families who have you know, stable internet, um, a computer that they can use, uh, you know, the right equipment to learn from home, the, the setup. A lot of students that we work with are um, in multi-generational households that um, you have as many as 10 people living in a two bedroom this is not the right condition for kids to be learning um, at home. So, um, so yeah, right now that's kind of like at the top of mind for me, you know, how, what's gonna be the fallout from this missed, you know, this missing past year in terms of education and how, what, what's gonna be needed to help solve that for these kids. Um, is it additional tutoring? Uh, is it, you know, um, you know, getting them kind of more help when it comes to applying to colleges? Uh, are colleges going to have to change the way they admit some people? So just kind of like the whole conversation around that is really fascinating to me. So that's what I'm um, I'm trying to wrap my head around right now. Um, we haven't seen the full fallout yet because you know students are still learning from home, and we won't know until they they have to go back and really kind of figure out how far they've fallen behind. Um, so yeah, that, I think that's like the most urgent issue right now that um, I'm really interested in studying and figuring out. That's great. And I guess I would be re remiss if not giving you the opportunity to let the audience know how they might be of help or service to what you're looking to do and the problems that you want to solve there. Yeah, that's a great question. I would encourage MIT alum if, uh, alums, if they're really passionate about this cause, to see what's going on in their local communities in terms of their local school districts, um, to see if there are any after school programs or looking for mentors. One-on-one um, -on -one tutoring is huge right now. It's really essential because, um, you know, having 20 students on a Zoom call trying to learn algebra is just not working. <laughs> so um, kind of that one-on-one -on -one interaction is really important. So I know there are a lot of nonprofits that uh, do tutoring. Um, they're looking for mentors. So I would encourage anyone to, to look into that. And even if it's not local, obviously everything's virtual now. Um, I always encourage local anyway, just because that's like the closest to a person's heart. But if there's nothing happening locally, look at, you know, look, you know, outside, outside of your city to see where the need is too. So, yeah. Great. That's awesome. Thanks, Lily. Okay, David, tell us, what's your one thing? So I think the one overarching question that drives um, a lot of my work at MIT and beyond is basically the question of who gets to participate in science, right? So I think it's a very, very similar um, kind of aspect to what, what Lily is looking at, um, but maybe from a slightly different angle. Um, you know, my background was in synthetic biology and is still, you know, a big area that I'm, I'm a part of and, and do a lot of active research in. But, um, you know, how do you ultimately make science, in this case, the life sciences, more accessible? How do you ensure that very diverse communities that are not normally at the table get at the table? Is it through new technologies? Is it through educational initiatives? Is it through, in my case, one of the things I've been most interested in uh, recently is global community organizing. So I'm, I basically have been trying to help to frame in a way a new discipline um, you can think about uh, their synthetic biology, but what is community biology? What's community bio? Is there a way that we're thinking about how um, a, a large decentralized network of people working all around the world together can solve big problems? So some of my research uh, this past year has, uh, past two years has been actively with, uh, the, with Sloan School and with the Center for Collective Intelligence, where we're thinking about the collective intelligence of these networks. And so again, you know, a lot of my background also is in, is in community organizing and movement building. So I work really closely with colleagues at Harvard Kennedy School to think about how do we apply movement dynamics to building out networks of communities that could be doing grassroots science. So that's like a big kind of social uh, science aspect of my work that you know really wasn't there. Um, or something that's more more recent for me for the past couple of years. So, so I would say that's kind of like the high level stuff. Um, I was joking or speaking with Lily a little bit earlier before the call. We're, we're launching this new diversity and leadership program at the Media Lab, where uh, we're really trying to build out a, a large program specifically focused on underrepresented minorities, thinking about the K through 12 pipeline, providing um, really innovative, cutting edge um, curriculum that can be developed by places like the Media Lab that's exploring science, art, design, engineering, um, but really having it focused towards students that uh, would not otherwise get those opportunities. And, and it's something, you know, Jalen Brown and I are working on a similar initiative with his foundation. So I think like that's kind of been like my core interest for a very long time and it's kind of manifested in, in a variety of different um, interesting ways. 
Yeah, it's great. Both really powerful missions. Um, obviously, something that is important, at least for me, I'm sure everyone on this on this uh, chat. Um, how can alumni that are participating tonight or maybe watching the recording later, how can they help? How can they get involved? Oh, this is actually a really great question. Um, for the for the diversity and leadership program, actually, I think there's a lot that um, we can do. You know, we're we're hoping in this first year to serve maybe about thousand kids, but we want this to be you know kind of a big program that uh, continues to grow um, annually. And so, yeah, so if you're interested, actually, in particular, you know, with your MIT hat on helping to support this uh, this initiative. Um, uh, one, I guess you can send me an email, <laughs> and I can we can talk more. I'll put my email in the chat, um, so you can message me at dkong at MIT. Um, I'm also on the various social media things at David Sun Kong. Um, but yeah, I mean, I you know I would love to talk more with folks that are interested. I think um, you know for those of you that have like interest in particularly like life sciences and equity, um, that's a core research interest of mine. Um, but also, if you're interested, kind of in a from an MIT perspective on how to help with diversity and leadership, then um, yeah, reach out to me directly. I'd love to talk with you more about it. Um, we're trying to fundraise, figure out how to connect with the right students, figure out how to develop the right curriculum. So I'm also hoping to work with Lily on this one too. So we'll we'll, we'll see how this all unfolds. But yeah, would love to connect and, and speak with as many as possible. That's great. Excellent. I'm sure you'll get a lot of takers, both of you. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Christina, who's going to take some more questions from the audience. Um, you both have been amazing and uh, just your insights have been extremely valuable, I know. So thanks. Christina, I give it back to you. It. Yeah, especially because um, I think Lily was talking earlier about, you know, maybe volunteering is the way to find what you love uh, to get your foot in the door before maybe being able to find a paid position. So definitely talk to these two if um, anything that they said really resonated with you. So David, uh, right before this, you mentioned putting your MIT hat on, uh, which I think is something that we all can relate to. I'm curious, um, what from your MIT education do you still carry with you? I know um, we talked a little bit about maybe the name, just using the MIT name to try and get your foot in the door. Um, some parts of your education you may or may not continue to use. So I'm just curious for you all, what has stuck with you over the years? Huh, that's a really great question. Hmm. So I think for me personally, like a lot of what I learned from MIT, um, as I mentioned before, you know, in my PhD at MIT, like what I really learned is like how to learn. Like, I don't think I really, like when I was an undergrad, I think I was a really terrible learner. I think like I did, I was like a very algorithmic learner. I would be like, I don't know why I divide by like three I here, but I just know you do it to get the right answer. You know, like that's kind of like a lot of my undergrad was like that. Um, it wasn't really, I think until grad school that I was like, man, like I actually need to make this device work, like, and if I actually need to get it to work, then, oh, this is, I think it was probably a critical insight, was like, I learned how to build mental models for myself. Like, I would actually kind of imagine like, all right, if I actually need to get this like system to work, like, like I would actually construct like a little model in my own mind of, of it. And I never really did that before until grad school. So I think that was a very useful, like learning how to learn thing. Um, so that I think there were certain content aspects, but I think that was one really critical thing I picked up from MIT. And I think the other thing too, just goes back to like the, um, you know, surrounding yourself with like great people, right? Like I think um, I felt so lucky, you know, my whole graduate career, like when I look at my colleagues that I went to grad school with, I'm like, holy crap, I can't believe I went to grad school with these people. Like, you know, it's like, I went like just in my, my research lab, there were two guys, two people that won MacArthur awards, like in my cohort, like, you know, in, the, in like the two years around me, you know, it's like, so like, I felt so lucky to be around people that were incredibly creative, super curious. And it just becomes the air you breathe when you're around people. And you know, they're also totally human and making all kinds of mistakes. And like, one of my funniest stories, this guy, uh, you know, Manu Prakash, who I went to grad school with, who's one of MacArthur, is like a tenured professor at Stanford. I mean, the dude used to just break stuff in our lab. Like every day I'd be like, Manu, <laughs> why are you breaking like the stuff in our lab? Like, that's all he would do. He's come over, break, break stuff in our lab. And then he published like his first science paper and we're like, oh, this is why you're breaking stuff in the lab. Like, this is kind of a cool reason to break things in our lab. And so, you know, so it's like, you just, it's, so surrounding yourself, I think with, with great people, I think is a, a, another big thing I learned from MIT. For sure. Anything you'd like to add, Lily? Yeah, I, I can't think of anything specific necessarily like from my MIT days, but I think this is, you know, David's story. And I think this is just common with a lot of MIT students naturally. I think a lot of MIT students tend to be really curious as to why things work and like why they should be doing a certain thing a certain way. Um, you know, 
not being like, I remember as an undergrad uh, working, you know, in my Europe's and stuff like that. I had no idea what was going on. So I would just do whatever. And, and like, I just do a bunch of things and to figure out what sticks. Right. But obviously that's actually how a lot of great research comes about. Right. So I think a lot of people are like, uh, I think not a lot, maybe, I think some people are perfectionists and they don't want to do something unless they're do they know that they're doing it right or they're doing it in, in, in the most perfect way. But I feel like that's like probably not the best way to achieve things sometimes. Like sometimes the best way is just to kind of do a bunch of things and see what, see what works. <laughs> so, and I, I still do that in, in my career right now, like, um, even when it's something like outreach, like, you know, uh, I'll email 20 people and maybe five people will email me back, but that's actually a great rate, right? So um, instead of worrying about finding the perfect people to reach out to, just cast a wide net and see what happens. So um, I think that's one thing that has been pretty consistent in my life that seems to be work working out uh, it, like working out okay for me. Um, actually, when I was a freshman at MIT, I remember um, I was actually really into physics. I wanted to be course eight. And as a freshman, I was really ambitious. I was like, I want to get a Europe with a, with a physics professor. And I remember very vividly emailing like 25 professors. I just went to the course eight website and looked at all the professors and like cold emailed them. And I was like, hey, I'm really interested in physics. Can I get a Europe with you? And maybe like maybe 10 people email me back and then maybe only like three of them actually had something for me to do um but one of the people that actually got back to me was actually um jerome friedman who was a nobel prize winning physicist <laughs> so i was like oh my god this is amazing so you never know like i would say just try a bunch of things don't be afraid and sometimes you get like really great results for sure i think i saw um liana you might have had a question would you yeah, absolutely. Would you want to come off mute and ask your question? Sure. Um, one, thank you guys so much for uh, helping out tonight. Both of your stories have just been like absolutely incredible. And for people that are just like graduating college and hearing of all the cool stuff that you guys are doing, it's it definitely helps keep you motivated. Um, so my question was actually, it sounds like both of you really enjoy what you're doing right now. And part of what you said was, you know, if you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing. But the other part was, well, when you find that happy balance of like everything, then you're in a good spot. But what is like the line that you guys find with like, hey, I found this thing, I really like it. And you grow into like some sort of complacency where you're like, you know, I really don't mind doing this the rest of my life versus like always having to find a new change and a new challenge. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a super great question. Um, and I think this just goes back to kind of seasons in your life, you know, um, like, I'm not sure, um, you know, how, where, where Lily is in this, but, you know, for myself, for example, you know, I, I don't have kids at the moment. Um, so, but I, I hope to one day and, um, you know, I can also sense for myself. It's funny. This is something that happened a lot to, to, for me during the pandemic. Like I can sense that like this kind of next phase of my life, while I still going to be, you know, doing hopefully impactful stuff in the world, I can feel that like I'm going to be doing a lot more kind of inner, inner work and inner development. Like I think my thirties was like really hardcore. Like I want to build lots of big things and do lots of stuff out in the world. And like, if you had to, if I had to pick, like, was I, if you, if you, if you, if you'd give me the option, like, could I have like a huge bustling community center in the middle of some metropolis versus like a house in the middle of nowhere on a lake? I would have picked the bustling community center 10 out of 10. But if you ask me now, I would pick the house on the lake in the middle of nowhere. Like that's kind of where I am right now. So, so I think it just depends on where you are in your, in your, the, the phase of your life. Like um, I, I do think though, like that process of like being uncomfortable and doing things that are new and challenging. Um, that's something I think I will probably continue to do. Cause even for me, it's like this, this is something I even do in my hobbies. You know, it's like, like I've been thinking a lot to myself, wow, like I really want to get into Chinese calligraphy. You know, this is something like, just to share like a little, little personal story. Um, you know, like I found out over the holidays, like my mom has cancer, which has been very, very tough. But, um, but, you know, it's forced me to think a lot about like, well, you know, what are the things that I want to do with my mom? And so then I started thinking about like little things that are like, you know, things that I kind of wanted to do maybe, but now are, are like, okay, I, I should really try to, you know, push myself and try to explore this thing that I didn't necessarily think I wanted to do before. So, so I think it's, you know, it's at each phase, you're, you're hungry for different things, you know, sometimes, you know, I, and I kind of see this for myself too, like, if and when I settle down and do have a family, 
I probably am not going to want a job where like, like right now it's like I travel, like, or I used to travel constantly, you know, I'm helping to set up this big network of labs all around the world. So I'm like traveling like Southeast Asia and Africa and doing all the stuff, which is like pretty exciting. Um, but then also part of me is like, I can know I'm not going to want to do this forever, you know? So, so I think, you know, at each stage in your life, you're sort of kind of constantly asking yourself, like, do I feel fulfilled? Right. I think that's one of the core things you want to ask yourself. And if you feel like something's missing, that's when it's like, okay, well, something about my current situation is not locked in right now. So how do I kind of get to the next phase of like better stability? Like, like I think for me, when I was doing both Lincoln lab and my community center, that was really stressful because I basically had two jobs. Like I had two jobs and I was working constantly and like looking back on it now, I'm like, I don't know how I did that. And that was crazy. I was like, you were a crazy person. Like during those years when I was doing that, it was like totally crazy. But, um, but now it's like, I've been able to settle it all into one job, but that took like a while of kind of strategizing to kind of get there. So I think having some patience as you go through the process too, but you know, I think it's just, you know, being really aware of yourself internally and like what is making you happy and what's not like, you know, like right now, like in my, my current job at the lab, I'm very happy. Like, I feel like, you know, I've got all of the, the ikigai like kind of aspects and I get the challenge, you know, pro project by project. So it's sort of like, you know, I might be pursuing something I haven't done before, but in a slightly different dynamic or a different way. So hopefully that's helpful, but, you know, interrogating yourself, you know, and asking yourself those questions on a regular basis, I think is really important. Yeah, um, I, I just add to that, like 100%, it depends on the person. If you're doing something and you already love it, you could do it for 10 years and be totally satisfied, like that's the dream, like keep doing what you're doing. But I guess if you're unsatisfied for some reason, or maybe you've hit a wall with what you're doing at work and you feel like you're not growing and you know, you're just not happy with the current situation, that's when I would probably start making some moves and start doing some things that might make you feel a little uncomfortable, but could lead to good things. So yeah, it 100% depends on where you are in your career, um, your personality, what, what you're happy with. Um, for me, like I am never satisfied. <laughs> I'm always like, I, I need to, I need to change things up. I need to do something else. Um, I have ADD basically. <laughs> so that's just my personality. Um, I feel like one minute I want to start my own clothing line. And then the next minute I'm like, oh no, I want to go in politics. So it, that's just like some, some people. But I definitely think, you know, if you're, it, it depends on what, what makes you happy, I think. That's awesome. Thank you both. Was there anyone else in the audience that had a question for our speakers? I think Julian had a question about product management that um, I just want to um, yeah, respond to real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think the question was around PM boot camps. So I would say um, if you're an MIT, it depends on where you are in your career, if you're an MIT alum, um, I think if you're already wor working in software or engineering for a tech company, it could be pretty easy for you to pivot into product management um, just because you already know a lot about engineering, you, you know what, what you know, what it takes to create a product, essentially. Um, product manager is just basically kind of like someone who kind of puts everything together, you know, and make sure you're delivering a product at the end. So you're, uh, you know, working with marketing teams to mm -hmm. communicate the product. Uh, you're working with engineers, obviously, to make sure the features are uh, executed. Uh, you're working with UI designers on design, and you're basically just like putting everything together. So if you're already in a situation where you already work in tech, um, you can probably find a way to pivot into product management um, somehow without having to do a boot camp. Uh, if you're not working in tech and you're just interested in getting into product management, uh, it, it might help. Um, it might also help to just maybe, you know, uh, start maybe at a startup, work, work for a startup um, that has fewer kind of requirements, job requirements, if you're, especially if you're a, a fresh grad. Um, and because just name dropping MIT will probably open a lot of doors for you. Um, a lot of startups are looking for product managers probably. So it, it's kind of a good way to get your foot through the door to kind of figure out what product management is about. That's how I got into product management. I just fell into it because that was the first job I had. I was essentially a product manager. I quickly figured out that basically product man what product managers do. Um, I think over the last 10 years, there's been more tools to help product managers like, you know, Jira and like Airtable and all this like Trello and all this project tracking software. Um, but, you know, at the very basis of product management is just to be a really, really great communicator, basically. Um, you're managing communications, you're managing expectations. 
um, and you're uh, basically making sure everyone on the team that has a role is doing their role and you know putting it together in the right way. So. Gotcha. Do you uh, just a follow up on that real quick? Do you find folks uh, that are coming through the pipes of in the PM world without traditional tech backgrounds, um, those with portfolios, does that help them? Uh, I guess. Uh, get through the, the door sooner or is that's not a hard requirement when breaking into the space? Um, I think it depends. You always need some kind of way to put your foot through the door into a PM role. Um, I've seen people go into junior PM roles by way of um, maybe working um, uh, technically like on the marketing team, but they're really good at communicating and they're really good at work like communicating certain things to the engineer. So if there's an opening, they might be considered for a junior product role. So um, uh, the key is basically to have, I think some tech experience or at least work for a tech company, even if you're in marketing or if you're in some other non-technical field, um, or if you don't have any background in that at all, probably um, try to explore what opportunities there might be for really fresh startups. Um, even if it's just like, a startup with one person <laughs> and it's more like someone's pet project or something like, you know, totally bootstrapped uh, and you just want to kind of like uh, get something on your resume that says that you, you, you worked as a product manager on some kind of, you know, product that could be another way to do it, but that's a little bit more kind of like ninja, I guess, because you're not really you might not actually be officially hired by a paying startup, but it's still, you're working in a product role in some sense. So, um, which I figure might be easier for MIT students to do, because again, the MIT name will take you very far. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what I would suggest. All right, thanks so much, Libby. And then I do just want to mention, so this is the fourth installment of Brass Rat Chats. The one right before this was in biotech, and then uh, one before that was also product management. I can't quite remember what the third was, um, but if you guys visit the MIT Alumni YouTube channel, you should be able to see all recordings, including this one, uh, in case you'd like to review those and, and see some of the other alumni stories. Um, and then uh, I do want to make sure uh, not anyone else in the audience had a question, so I'll just pause for a second to see, you know, last call. <laughs> I was curious about one thing, if I can. <laughs> um, so maybe it's the data scientist in me, but I'm curious about how you all measure your impact and what does that look like? Is it sort of community feedback or metrics? I'm just curious about that whole process. Um, that's a super great question. I think uh, measuring impact, um, certainly like knowing how to do that well is very important in different types of social impact. Like if you're more on the NGO side, this is like a huge part of your life basically is like being able to articulate like how many students am I serving? Like how do you, you know, assess, you know, how educational, uh, you know, goals have shifted after being through your program, et cetera. I mean, there's there's all kinds of ways that people try to measure social impact, which um, I, I admittedly am not an expert in. I think Lily might have um, some more insights there. Um, but certainly I think that's a huge part of, of a, just in general in your life and your work, right? I mean, it's funny, I think you, one thing that I think is useful, no matter what you end up doing, you need to figure out how to raise money to support whatever it is the thing you're doing. And almost always there's some aspect of like, you know, convincing some entity or individual to give you money that involves uh, basically what you're talking about, Christina, which is like kind of articulating in some way, you know, what the impact of this work is, what the scale of the work is, um, and so on. Um, I think the one other just quick thing um, I was thinking of, uh, just the final comment for me is like, um, it, it can be really helpful to find somebody that you think is doing, has a job that you think is cool, or you're like, I, how did that person end up in that role doing whatever it is that they're doing? If you figure that, if you can find a role model like that, where you're like, hey, I would love to figure that out, then make friends with that person and be like, hey, can, can I like learn from you? Is it possible for me to like just understand more how you got to where you got to? I know for myself at various stages, that's been a big part of like my own kind of mentor journey is like looking at a person and being like, how did they end up there? And like, how did they do that? You know, and then, you know, really trying to, to learn from that person if it's if it's possible to do um, or somebody like them, right? Because I think that can help, you know, expand your, your imagination again for what might be possible for yourself. Love that. Um, yeah, just to uh, 
kind of my take on the measuring impact. How do we measure impact? Um, uh, for us, it's pretty straightforward because we work with uh, after school programs and students. So um, obviously we uh, count the number of students that we reach every year. Um, a lot of our students are actually first generation college students. So um, a big part of our programs is helping them get into college and also helping them graduate from college and getting a degree. Um, so that's pretty easy to measure. I, I want to say I think 90 over 90% of the students that go through our programs um, are actually from first generation college going households. So just that alone, we know we're definitely making an impact because these students are coming from families that have never gotten higher education, basically. So um, depending on what the cause is, every cause has their own kind of uh, impact or metric figures. Um, for us, since we work with students, it's we definitely look at the number of students that we serve, um, how they're performing ac academically. Um, you know, we track their GPAs. Uh, we track the number of colleges that they're applying to. You know, what you know, what programs they're getting into, um, and things like that. So, um, but yeah, every every different cause definitely has their kind of key metrics um, that you know they need to keep track of for sure. That's very insightful. Thank you for sharing. Um, so. That is basically all the time we have. It's almost nine o'clock. So thank you all um, for attending. And I especially want to thank Lily and David for being with us, for all of your um, outstanding sharing and um, just learning from your experiences is very helpful, especially for me as an alumni and hopefully for the rest of the audience. Um, I just want to remind everyone to please mark your calendars for next month's Brass Rat Chat on February 25th. Um, our featured alumni guests will be talking about careers in academia. So uh, thank you all again. I think in the chat we mentioned um, the Alumni Advisors Hub. If you'd like to visit, you can chat with MIT alumni from all across the, the alumni spectrum, whether they're MIT 10 or much further along in their, their career journeys um, and hopefully find some value there. So thanks again, everyone, and um, have a great evening. Thank you so much, Christina and Ellen and everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank to all the organizers for making this happen. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.